Section 5 of Tales in Space and Time by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Story of the Stone Age, Part 3 The First Horseman. In the days before Aglomi, there was little trouble between the horses and men. They lived apart. The men in the river swamps and thickets, the horses on the wide grassy uplands between the chestnuts and the pines. Sometimes a pony would come straying into the clogging marshes to make a flint-hacked meal, and sometimes the tribe would find one, the kill of a lion, and drive off the jackals, and feast heartily, while the sun was high. These horses of the old time were clumsy at the fetlock and dun-colored, with a rough tail and big head. They came every springtime northwestward into the country after the swallows and before the hippopotami, as the grass on the wide downland stretches grew long. They came only in small bodies thus far, each herd, a stallion and two or three mares, and a foal or so, having its own stretch of country, and they went again when the chestnut trees were yellow, and the wolves came down the wilden mountains. It was their custom to graze right out in the open, going in the cover only in the heat of day. They avoided the long stretches of thorn and beechwood, preferring an isolated group of trees void of ambuscade, so that it was hard to come up upon them. They were never fighters. Their heels and teeth were for one another. But in the clear country, once they were started, no living thing came near them, though perhaps the elephant might have done so, had he felt the need. And in those days, man seemed a harmless thing enough. No whisper of prophetic intelligence told the species of the terrible slavery that was to come, of the whip and spur and bearing rein, the clumsy load and the slippery streets, the insufficient food and the knacker's yard that was to replace the wide grassland and the freedom of the earth. Down in the way marshes, Aglomi and Udina had never seen the horses closely, but now they saw them every day as the two of them raided out from their lair on the ledge in the gorge, raiding together in search of food. They had returned to the ledge after the killing of Andu. For the she-bear, they were not afraid. The she-bear had become afraid of them, and when she winded them, she went aside. The two went together everywhere, for since they had left the tribe, Udina was not so much Uglomi's woman as his mate, and she learned to hunt, as much, that is, as any woman could. She was indeed a marvelous woman. He would lie for hours watching a beast, or planning catches in that shock head of his, and she would stay beside him, with her bright eyes upon him, offering no irritating suggestions, as still as any man a wonderful woman. At the top of the cliff was an open grassy lawn, and then beech woods, and going through the beech woods, one came to the edge of the rolling grassy expanse, and in sight of the horses. Here on the edge of the wood and bracken were the rabbit burrows, and here among the fronds, Udina and Uglomi would lie with their throwing stones ready, until the little people came out to nibble and play in the sunset. And while Udina would sit, a silent figure of watchfulness, regarding the burrows, Uglomi's eyes were ever away across the green sward at those wonderful grazing strangers. In a dim way, he appreciated their grace and their supple nimbleness. As the sun declined in the evening time and the heat of the day passed, they would become active, would start chasing one another, neighing, dodging, shaking their manes, coming round in great curves, sometimes so close that the pounding of the turf sounded like hurried thunder. It looked so fine that Uglomi wanted to join in badly, and sometimes one would roll over on the turf, kicking four hoofs heavenward, which seemed formidable and was certainly much less alluring. Dim imaginations ran through Uglomi's mind as he watched, by virtue of which two rabbits lived the longer and sleeping, his brains were clearer and bolder, for that was the way in those days. He came near the horses, he dreamt, and fought 
smiting stone against hoof. But then the horses changed to men, or at least to men with horses' heads, and he awoke in a cold sweat of terror. Yet the next day in the morning, as the horses were grazing, one of the mares whinnied, and they saw Uglomi coming up the wind. They all stopped their eating and watched him. Uglomi was not coming towards them, but strolling obliquely across the open, looking at anything in the world but horses. He had stuck three fern fronds into the mat of his hair, giving him a remarkable appearance, and he walked very slowly. "'What's up now?' said the master horse, who was capable but inexperienced. "'It looks more like the first half of an animal than anything else in the world,' he said. Four legs and no hind.' "'It's only one of those pink monkey things,' said the eldest mare. "'They're a sort of river monkey. They're quite common on the plains.' Uglomi continued his oblique advance. The eldest mare was struck with the want of motive in his proceedings. Fool, said the eldest mare, in a quick conclusive way she had. She resumed her grazing. The master horse and the second mare followed suit. Look, he's nearer, said the foal with a stripe. One of the younger foals made uneasy movements. Uglomi squatted down and sat regarding the horses fixedly. In a little while, he was satisfied that they meant neither flight nor hostilities. He began to consider his next procedure. He did not feel anxious to kill, but he had his axe with him, and the spirit of the sport was upon him. How would one kill one of these creatures, these great, beautiful creatures? Eudena, watching him with fearful admiration from the cover of the bracken, saw him presently go on all fours and so proceed again. But the horses preferred him a biped to a quadruped, and the master horse threw up his head and gave the word to move. Uglomi thought they were off for good, but after a minute's gallop they came round in a wide curve and stood winding him. Then, as a rise in the ground hit him, they tailed out, the master horse leading, and approached him spirally. He was as ignorant of the possibilities of a horse as they were of his, and at this stage it would seem he funked. He knew this kind of stalking would make red deer or buffalo charge, if it were persisted in. At any rate, Eudena saw him jump up and come walking towards her with the fern plumes held in his hand. She stood up, and he grinned to show that the whole thing was an immense lark, and that what he had done was just what he had planned to do from the very beginning. So the incident ended, but he was very thoughtful all that day. The next day, this foolish drab creature with the leonine mane, instead of going about the grazing or hunting he was made for, was prowling round the horses again. The eldest mare was all for silent contempt. I suppose he wants to learn something from us, she said. Let him. The next day he was at it again. The master horse decided he meant absolutely nothing. But as a matter of fact, Uglomi, the first of men to feel that curious spell of the horse that binds us even to this day, meant a great deal. He admired them unreservedly. There was a rudiment of the snob in him, I'm afraid, and he wanted to be near these beautiful curved animals. Then there were vague conceptions of a kill if only they would let him come near them. But they drew the line he found at fifty yards. If he came nearer than that, they moved off with dignity. I suppose it was the way he had blinded Andu that made him think of leaping on the back of one of them. But though Eudena, after a time, came out in the open too, and they did some unobtrusive stalking, things stopped there. Then one memorable day, a new idea came to Uglomi. The horse looks down and level, but he does not look up. No animal looks up. They have too much common sense. It was only that fantastic creature, man, could waste his wits skyward. Uglomi made no philosophical deductions, but he perceived the thing was so. So he spent a weary day in a beach that stood in the open while Eudena stalked. Usually, 
The horses went into the shade in the heat of the afternoon, but that day the sky was overcast, and they would not, in spite of Eudena's solicitude. It was two days after that that Uglomi had his desire. The day was blazing hot, and the multiplying flies asserted themselves. The horses stopped grazing before midday and came into the shadow below him and stood in couples, nose to tail, flapping. The master horse, by virtue of his heels, came closest to the tree, and suddenly there was a rustle and a creak, a thud. Then a sharp chipped flint bit him on the cheek. The master horse stumbled, came on one knee, rose to his feet, and was off like the wind. The air was full of the whirl of limbs, the prance of hoofs, and snorts of alarm. Uglomi was pitched a foot in the air, came down again, up again, his stomach hit violently, and then his knees got a grip of something between them. He found himself clutching with knees, feet, and hands, careening violently with extraordinary oscillation through the air. His axe gone heaven knows whither. Hold tight, said Mother Instinct, and he did. He was aware of a lot of coarse hair in his face, some of it between his teeth, and of green turf streaming past in front of his eyes. He saw the shoulder of the master horse, fast and sleek, with the muscles flowing swiftly under the skin. He perceived that his arms were round the neck, and that the violent jerkings he experienced had a sort of rhythm. Then he was in the midst of a wild rush of tree stems, and then there were fronds of bracken about, and then more open turf, then a stream of pebbles rushing past, little pebbles flying sideways athwart the stream from the blow of the swift hoofs. A gloamy began to feel frightfully sick and giddy, but he was not the stuff to leave go simply because he was uncomfortable. He dared not leave his grip, but he tried to make himself more comfortable. He released his hug on the neck, gripping the mane instead. He slipped his knees forward, and pushing back, came into a sitting position where the quarters broadened. It was nervous work, but he managed it, and at last he was fairly seated astride, breathless indeed and uncertain, but with that frightful pounding of his body at any rate relieved. Slowly the fragments of Uglomi's mind got into order again. The pace seemed to him terrific, but a kind of exaltation was beginning to oust his first frantic terror. The air rushed by, sweet and wonderful. The rhyme of the hoofs changed and broke up and returned into itself again. They were on turf now, a wide glade, the beech trees a hundred yards away on either side, and a succulent band of green, starred with pink blossoms, and shot with silver water here and there, meandered down the middle. Far off was a glimpse of blue valley, far away. The exaltation grew. It was man's first taste of pace. Then came a wide space dappled with flying fallow deer scattering this way and that, and then a couple of jackals, mistaking Uglomi for a lion, came hurrying after him. And when they saw it was not a lion, they still came on out of curiosity. On galloped the horse with his one idea of escape, and after him the jackals, with pricked ears and quickly barked remarks. Which kills first, said the first jackal. It's the horse being killed, said the second. They gave the howl of following, and the horse answered to it, as the horse answers nowadays to the spur. On they rushed, a little tornado through the quiet day, putting up startled birds, sending a dozen unexpected things darting to cover, raising a myriad of indignant dung-flies, and smashing little blossoms, flowering complacently, back into their parental turf. Trees again, and then splash-splash across the torrent. Then a hare shot out of the turf of grass under the very hoofs of the master horse, and the jackals left them incontinently. So presently they broke into the open again, a wide expanse of turfy hillside, the very grassy downs that fall northward nowadays from the Epson stand. The first hot bolt of Master Horse 
was long since over. He was falling into a measured trot, in Ugh Lomi, albeit bruised exceedingly and quite uncertain of the future, was in a state of glorious enjoyment. And now came a new development. The pace broke again. The master horse came round on a short curve and stopped dead. Ugh Lomi became alert. He wished he had his flint, but the throwing flint he had carried in a thong about his waist was, like the axe, heaven knows where. The master horse turned his head, and Ugh Lomi became aware of eye and teeth. He whipped his leg into a position of security and hit at the cheek with his fist. Then the head went down, somewhere out of existence apparently, and the back he was sitting on flew up into a dome. Ugh Lomi became a thing of instinct again, strictly prehensile. He held by knees and feet, and his head seemed sliding towards the turf. His fingers were twisted into the shock of mane, and the rough hair of the horse saved him. The gradient he was on lowered again, and then, whoop, said Ugh Lomi, astonished, and the slant was the other way up. But Ugh Lomi was a thousand generations nearer the primordial than man. No monkey could have held on better, and the lion had been training the horse for countless generations against the tactics of rolling and rearing back. But he kicked like a master, and Buck jumped rather neatly. In five minutes, Ugh Lomi lived a lifetime. If he came off, the horse would kill him, he felt assured. The master horse decided to stick to his old tactics again, and suddenly went off at a gallop. He headed down the slope, taking the steep places at a rush, swerving neither to the right nor to the left. And as they rode down, the wide expanse of valley sank out of sight behind the approaching skirmishes of Oak and Hawthorn. They skirted a sudden hollow with the pool of a spring, rank weeds and silver bushes. The ground grew softer and the grass taller, and on the right-hand side and the left came scattered bushes of may, still splashed with belated blossoms. Presently the bushes thickened until they lashed the passing rider, and little flashes and gouts of blood came out on horse and man. Then the way opened again. And then came a wonderful adventure. A sudden squeal of unreasonable anger rose amid the bushes, the squeal of some creature bitterly wrong and crashing after them appeared a big, gray-blue shape. It was Yah, the big-horned rhinoceros, in one of those fits of fury of his, charging full tilt after the manner of his kind. He had been startled at his feeding, and someone, it did not matter who, was to be ripped and trampled, therefore. He was bearing down on them from the left, with his wicked little eye red, his great horn down, and his tail like a jury-mast behind. For a minute Ugh Lomi was minded to slip off and dodge, and then, behold, the staccato of the hoofs grew swifter, and the rhinoceros and his stumpy little hurrying legs seemed to slide out at the back corner of Ugh Lomi's eyes. In two minutes they were through the bushes of May and out in the open going fast. For a space he could hear the ponderous paces in pursuit receding behind him, and then it was just as if Yah had not lost his temper, as if Yah had never existed. The pace never faltered. On they rode, and on. Aglomi was now all exaltation. To exalt in those days was to insult. Yaha, big nose, he said, trying to crane back and see some remote speck of a pursuer. Why don't you carry your smiting stone in your fist? He ended with a frantic whoop. But that whoop was unfortunate, for coming close to the ear of the horse, and being quite unexpected, it startled the stallion extremely. He shied violently. Aglomi suddenly found himself uncomfortable again. He was hanging on to the horse, he found, by one arm and one knee. The rest of the ride was honorable but unpleasant. The view was chiefly of blue sky and that was combined with the most unpleasant physical sensations. Finally, a bush of thorn lashed him, and he let go. He hit the ground with his cheek and shoulder, and then, after a complicated 
and an extraordinarily rapid movement, hit it again with the end of his backbone. He saw splashes and sparks of light and color. The ground seemed bouncing about, just like the horse had done. Then he found he was sitting on turf, six yards beyond the bush. In front of him was a space of grass, growing greener and greener, and a number of human beings in the distance, and the horse was going round at a smart gallop, quite a long way off to the right. The human beings were on the opposite side of the river, some still in the water, but they were all running away as hard as they could. The advent of a monster that took two pieces was not the sort of novelty they cared for. For quite a minute, Oglomi sat regarding them in a purely spectacular spirit. The bend of the river, the knoll among the reeds and royal ferns, the thin streams of smoke going up to heaven, were all perfectly familiar to him. It was a squatting place of the sons of Ua, of Ua from whom he had fled with Udina, and whom he had waylaid in the chestnut woods and killed with the first axe. He rose to his feet, still dazed from his fall, and as he did so, the scattering fugitives turned and regarded him. Some pointed to the receding horse and chattered. He walked slowly towards them, staring. He forgot the horse. He forgot his own bruises. In the growing interest of this encounter, there were fewer of them than there had been. He supposed the others must have hid. The heap of fern for the night fire was not so high. By the flint heaps should have sat Wau, but then he remembered he had killed Wau. Suddenly, brought back to this familiar scene, the gorge and the bears and Udina seemed things remote, things dreamt of. He stopped at the bank and stood regarding the tribe. His mathematical abilities were of the slightest, but it was certain there were fewer. The men might be away, but there were fewer women and children. He gave the shout of homecoming. His quarrel had been with Uya and Wau, not with the others. Children of Ua, he cried. They answered with his name, a little fearfully because of the strange way he had come. For a space they spoke together. Then an old woman lifted a shrill voice and answered him, Our Lord is a lion. Uglomi did not understand that saying. They answered him again, several together. Uya comes again. He comes as a lion. Our Lord is a lion. He comes at night. He slays whom he will. But none other may slay us. Uglomi, none other may slay us. Still Uglomi did not understand. Our Lord is a lion. He speaks no more to men. Uglomi stood regarding them. He had had dreams. He knew that though he had killed Uya, Uya still existed. And now they told him Uya was a lion. The shriveled old woman, the mistress of the fireminders, suddenly turned and spoke softly to those next to her. She was a very old woman indeed, and she had been the first of Uya's wives and he had let her live beyond the age to which it is seemly a woman should be permitted to live. She had been cunning from the first, cunning to please Ua and to get food. And now she was great in counsel. She spoke softly, and Uglomi watched her, shriveled from across the river with a curious distaste. Then she called aloud, Come over to us, Uglomi. A girl suddenly lifted up her voice, Come over to us, Uglomi, she said, and they all began crying, Come over to us, Uglomi. It was strange how their manner changed after the old woman called. He stood quite still, watching them all. It was pleasant to be called, and the girl who had called first was a pretty one, but she made him think of Udina. Come over to us, Uglomi, they cried, and the voice of the shriveled old woman rose above them all. At the sound of her voice, his hesitation returned. He stood on the river bank, Uglomi, Ugg the thinker, with his thoughts slowly taking shape. Presently one and then another paused to see what he would do. He was minded to go back, and he was minded not to. Suddenly his fear, or his caution, got the upper hand. Without answering them, he turned and walked back towards the distant thorn trees the way he had come. Forthwith, 
the whole tribe started crying to him again very eagerly. He hesitated and turned. Then he went on. Then he turned again. And then once again regarding them with troubled eyes as they called. The last time he took two paces back before his fear stopped him. They saw him stop once more and suddenly shake his head and vanish among the hawthorn trees. Then all the women and children lifted up their voices together and called to him in one last vain effort. Far down the river, the reeds were stirring in the breeze, where convenient for his new sort of feeding, the old lion, who had taken the man-eating, had made his lair. The old woman turned her face that way and pointed to the hawthorn thickets. Ooyah, she screamed, there goes thine enemy. There goes thy enemy, Ooya. Why do you devour us nightly? We have tried to snare him. There goes thine enemy, Ooya. But the lion who preyed upon the tribe was taken his siesta. The cry went unheard. That day he had dined on one of the plumper girls, and his mood was a comfortable placidity. He really did not understand that he was Ua, or that Uglomi was his enemy. So it was that Uglomi rode the horse, and heard first of Ua the lion, who had taken the place of Ua the master, and was eating up the tribe. As he hurried back to the gorge, his mind was no longer full of the horse. But the thought of Ua was still alive, to slay or be slain. Over and over again, he saw the shrunken band of women and children crying that Ua was a lion. Ua was a lion. And presently, fearing the twilight might come upon him, Aglomi began running. End of section five.